I'm real nervous. <laughs> Never done stuff like this before. Um, one of the things I love about that Max McLean reading of the Bible that, that Crossway put out is his voice to me sounds like Sideshow Bob. <laughs> and it's just kind of cool to have Sideshow Bob read you the Bible. Um, <laughs> let me pray for us and, and we'll, we'll jump in. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the clarity uh, with which Paul speaks and writes about the gospel um, all over the place, but, but particularly in Galatians 3. And I ask that uh, as I preach this morning, that your spirit would be at work, that uh, the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts may be pleasing in your sight, and that as we gaze upon the glory of Christ, even now we may be transformed from one glory to another. We ask this in Christ's most precious name, amen. I love Galatians 3. It's, it's one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible because of how clear Paul makes uh, law gospel distinctions because of how clear he helps us understand the importance of the gospel because of how clear he makes statements about uh, various covenants in the Old Testament that we often just don't know what to do with. Uh, but, but I also like it because he doesn't pull any punches when he dives in uh, to this point in the Galatians. He's kind of told his story and, and things that we heard from, from Dan and, and from Gretchen. And he's, he's been laying out the gospel and saying, look, this is what it is. But then he turns to the Galatians in these first five verses of chapter 3. And he, he just waylays them with these rhetorical questions. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Who, who led you astray? Who, who's got you under their spell? What is going on? I gave you the gospel. I portrayed Christ as crucified clearly before you. What is the freaking problem? <laughs> That's his tone. He's mad. He's heartbroken. He's undone because these people that he gave the gospel to, who, who looked to Jesus and, and rested in him, they, they began that way as, as he, he makes these contrasts between spirit and flesh and, and, and between the law and hearing by faith. That they began, it, it seemed on the right course, but now these stinking Judaizers came in with their law and they were like, hey, well, you need to do this and you need to do that. Jesus is fine, but add this stuff to it. And they were like, oh, huh, okay. And, and just like that, they were off track. And it's easy for us to hear that and be like, yeah, man, I mean, if Paul came and preached here, I don't think we would have this problem. <laughs> what, what's up, Galatians? But here's the thing. We would absolutely have this problem. 100% of the time, we would have this problem. It, it, now, now, maybe, it, like in America in 2023, maybe like, Circumcision wouldn't be the issue, right? Jib cutting to wherever Dan is, right? Maybe that wouldn't be our issue that we were like, well, we need to do more of that. But we love the law. We love the law. And not in like a, I want to like honor God with all of my life. No, we, we want to do all the things that, that, that Chad talked about, that Dan has talked about, that Gretchen's talked about, that Paul's, we, we want to feel righteous. We want to feel like, look, I'm, I'm a good boy. I did the things. I'm a good girl. I did, I did the things. We have this problem where we hear this story, and, and, and the story, go, it, it's about Jesus and him, him dying on the cross to pay for our sins. It, it's, it's about the, the substitutionary atonement. It's about all that, that beautiful stuff, imputation, the whole nine yards. We hear that story. And we hear that like, hey, it's all free. The kingdom of God is yours for free. Forgiveness, yours for free. Righteousness, yours for free. Being made a new creation in Christ. Being raised to walk in newness of life. Yours for free in Jesus. And here's what we immediately do. We take all that stuff that's offered for free in Jesus and then we try to get it for ourselves. And we do it in a thousand ways. If you're a parent, you've, you've undoubtedly, and maybe I'm just telling on myself here, but you've undoubtedly seen your kids struggle and, and your thought, I mean, somewhere in there, there is like, oh man, I'm heartbroken for my child. But somewhere in there also is, 
What did I do wrong? Does, does, does God, like, does he love me? I tried to do all the things right. Like, we, we'll, we'll do this with our jobs and, and whether or not we're successful. We'll do this with our marriages. We'll do this with, uh, with our ministry. Look, if you're a pastor, my, my, I, I, you're supposed to ask before you do this. Sorry, Annie. Um, here, here's what it looks like for a pastor. You, you go on Sunday, you do all the things, you preach, and then you go home and, and you look at your wife and you're like, hey, do you have any thoughts about the sermon this morning? Because really all you're wanting is to be built up. No, you did a good job. God was honored. Way to go. It's so dumb. Who has bewitched us? See, these questions aren't just for the, these questions in these first five verses are for us as well. Because we confuse these categories all the time. We, we, we constantly think like, okay, yeah, I, I got started in the spirit. I, got, I, I heard the gospel. I believed. I was free. Whew, now I got to get to work. We, we do this all the time. Constantly. Constantly we do this. So, so these questions are for us just like they were for the Galatians. Th these are five questions for people who forget the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. These five what in the world are you doing questions. And, and we would do good at, to, to kind of go back to them again and again and just be reminded like, yeah, I didn't get started on this, on the, on this, this road of resting in Jesus by obeying the law. Actually, I got started on this road by, by, rescuing, by, by utterly breaking the law and, and, and seeing that I needed a savior and being told I had one and believing that. Maybe we should keep doing that. And, and then, and I want to be a, just a little bit of a nerd here for just a second. In, in the ESV, for some reason, that's inexplicable to me, they, they attach verse 6 to verse 5. So if you've got the ESV... Um, literally the only like major English translation that does this. NAS, New Living, New King James, King James, NIV. Everybody else attaches verse six to verse seven like it is in the Greek text. So ignore the M dash that's there between five and six in, in, in the ESV. Chapter six, or verse six down through 14, Paul stops with the questions and then he's like, okay, now here's what I'm gonna do. Because y'all have gone back to the law, because, because you heard the gospel and now you're running back to the law thinking, oh, I got to do this. I'm going to explain to you from the Old Testament, primarily from the law and a couple references from prophets who were expositing the law. I'm going to explain to you the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And, and here's, here's what happens in verses 6 through verses 14. In, in verse 6, he quotes Genesis 15, 6. Verse 7, he, he's, he's applying that. Verse 8, he quotes Genesis 12, 3. V verse 9, he, he's referencing or, or an allusion, depending on how you want to define those fun technical words. He, he's pointing back to, to Genesis 22, 18. Verse 10, he quotes Deuteronomy 27, 26. Verse 11, he quotes Habakkuk 2, 4. Verse 12, Leviticus 18, 5. Verse 13, Deuteronomy 21, 23. And then verse 14 is an allusion to like Joel 2, Isaiah 32, Isaiah 44, the promise of the spirit that's gonna be poured out. In other words, everything from verse six to verse 14, for the most part, is the Old Testament. And, it, and, and it's Paul saying, guys, guess what? Good news, I went back. I double-checked my work, I reread the Old Testament, and guess what I found out? It's about Jesus too. It was never about, hey, be good, and, and you win the big teddy bear. No, it, it, was, it was about, hey, you're going to need a Savior. It's fascinating, in Deuteronomy 30, you, you get this, this weird shift in the tenses of the verb in, 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 at verse one, and, and it goes future. And so the, like you've got the curses and the blessings for disobedience and obedience and all that, which by the way, reminds us and teaches us when you read the, the promises for blessing and it's like, look, it's gonna be amazing if you do all this. I mean, it, it puts, it puts the, the greatest name it, claim it, health, wealth, Prosperity gospel preacher to shame when you read the promises connected. See, here, here's what we got to remember. 
motivation to keep the law isn't our problem. We were given all the motivation in the world. The problem is us. It's not that we just needed to be motivated more. It's that we can't do it. And, and we see that in Deuteronomy 30. He says, after all these blessings and curses are announced, he says, when all these curses come up on you, that's got to be like the most depressing moment for them. Here's all the blessings for obedience. Here's all the curses for disobedience. Now, when all these curses come up on you, in other words, when you fail utterly, then I'm going to do something. I'm going to circumcise your heart. I'm going to bring you back. See, Paul is making that point. He goes back to, to the, the promises given to Abraham in Genesis 5 and 12 and 22. He goes to the law itself in Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy 27, the prophets, uh, the law again in Leviticus the, the, and, and Deuteronomy. And he's saying, look, this is what it's about. It was never about, not, not for a second, was it about getting it right being so good that God brings you in. <laughs> and, and this, we read this and we're like, wow, okay, yeah, I mean, it's right there. This shouldn't surprise us because John 5, 39, what did Jesus say? You, you search the scriptures, which obviously at that point, if we just think logically, historically for a second, had to be the Old Testament. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life, but they bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me. Or we can go to, to we, we all know 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scriptures breathed out by God. Okay, bag it up, two verses, Sunday school teachers, and have your kids remember, memorize verse 14 and 15 also, right? Why? Because he tells Timothy, remember the scriptures. Again, New Testament is actively being written as he's writing these verses, so it has to be the Old Testament. Remember the scriptures which you were acquainted from your youth, how they are able to make you wise for what? Salvation, How? through faith in Christ. See, Paul's whole point here is he's, as he's combating the Judaizers and Jesus' point over and over and over again is if you're missing Jesus when you read the Old Testament, if you're missing grace when you read the Old Testament, if you're missing that this whole thing is about faith, then you're misreading the whole Bible not just Galatians, not just the Gospels, the entire blooming thing. That's Paul's point here. If you're missing Jesus, you're missing the point. And, and he proves that in spades with just stacking Old Testament references on top of each other. Then in, in, in verse 15 down through 18, he, he, he offers a, a, the gospel, the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Not, not in this kind of systematic, I'm going to proof text kind of way, but just like, hey, well, let's just look at the flow of the story. Let's just, let's look at redemptive history and see how that worked out. And, and we, we read, this is the promises were made to Abraham 430 years later, the law came and, and the, the later thing doesn't undo the prior thing. This is what I mean, he says. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. What was the promise? Well, he told us. Abraham's offspring is going to get it all. Who, who, who is the offering? He tells us that too. He, pointing to, again, he's still looking at the Old Testament, Genesis 17, 8 here. Not referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. See, he, he's telling us, like, look, God's plan was always Jesus. Always. He, he's wanting us to understand that, that it, it's not our natural generation in Abraham's physical line, but our regeneration by the Spirit in faith that makes us sons of Abraham. That's what he's driving at. That's what he wants us to get. That's what he wants the Galatians to get. That's what we need to be reminded of. That's what the good news is. It's not about who you were born to. Are, are there blessings to be born in a Christian family? Absolutely, you're raised hearing the gospel. That's the blessing of being raised in a Christian family. 
You're baptized. You're brought when you're a baby and the waters of baptism are poured on you or are sprinkled on you and you're raised being pointed to Jesus, the one who can save you. It's the spirit at work in us. See, the law can only do one thing to sinners. All that the law can do is condemn us. That's it. As as, as Gretchen said, the law doesn't kill sin in us. It doesn't. It can't. It, It condemns us. And when the law used by God in his steadfast love has done its work of condemning us to death, which is all it can do in a sinner, then the Holy Spirit d- does, does his work. He, he drags our condemned, dead in sin corpse to the foot of the cross, washes us with the blood of the lamb, crucifies us with Christ, and raises us to walk in newness of life. The law doesn't give us life. The Spirit does. And that's Paul's point as, as he reminds him of the, the redemptive story. Promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. And the law doesn't undo those promises at all. Not even a little bit. It doesn't even turn the dial down on them. They stand in all their glory for you. For you. And and apparently Paul then, we see in verse 19 through 22, had the same issue, it's weird, the same issue that Chad Bird does when he talks about the gospel. Yes, but. And and Paul saw that, like, apparently, like, he had been posting, like, on Carrier Pigeon, like, however they did social media back then, and he, like, knew that sure bet that, that Chad was talking about this morning, and he was like, okay, I just said the gospel. I just said you can't do it yourself. I just said it, it, it's God who does it. It's the spirit that you need. I just said all these things, so here it comes. So I'm just going to answer the question for him. Well, then why the law? Because you're a sinner. That's his answer. It was because of transgression. And it, it has, it ha, the, the law has like this, this planned obsolescence, like your, like your phone. <laughs> Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Okay, what, what does that mean? That, that means that, that when Jesus, when we're united to Christ by faith, we don't run back to the law. The, the Israelites, like us, were real good at running back. What, what, they, they're in the wilderness. They've been freed from slavery. And they're in the wilderness. What do they say? Well, back there we had fish to eat. Let's go back there. You brought us out here to kill us. We just do this to ourselves constantly, don't we? And, and, and so, so we need to hear Paul on this. The law has a purpose. The, the problem isn't the law. I want to be real clear about that because sometimes people think like, I, I think the law is broken somehow. No, 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 no. The law is not broken. The law is really good at doing what it's supposed to do. We're just really bad at remembering what it is that the law is supposed to do. <laughs> the law is not supposed to save us. It can't. It it never has, never will. And then Paul makes this really weird point. It was put in place by an email through through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. If you go read five commentaries, you're going to get five answers. Here's what I think is going on here. I think think he's dealing with the difference between the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenant here. Right? And I think, I think with, with Moses, with the law, you have this intermediary where Moses goes, he talks to God, and they're like, hey, do this. And he goes, and they're like, hey, we'll do that. Cool. Bam, sign us up. We're in. Doesn't work real well. But when the Abrahamic covenant was made, there was no intermediary. Abraham's asleep on the sidelines, and, and the flaming torch passes through all the cut pieces by itself. God is one. 
Two people didn't pass through taking the obligations of that covenant and, and, and securing those promises on each other. No, God was like, look, you're, I've got this. This is something I'm going to do for you. This is my promise for you. I'm going to do it. And, and no one else is going to be involved in getting it done but, but me, the triune God of all creation. I'm doing all of it. I'm dying for your sin. I'm making you righteous. I'm filling you with the spirit. I'm doing it. God is one. Yes, but Paul hears it again. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? No. Why? Because the law can't save you. The promises can. We're talking about two different functions here. The scripture imprisoned things under sin. Why? So that the promise might come to you in Jesus Christ by faith. Those aren't contrary. They're actually working together. If, if they were contrary, what that means, that doesn't mean they would be doing different things. That means they would be both trying to do the same thing. That's what it would be for the law to be contrary to the gospel. It would be the law going, I can save you, just try harder. And Jesus is going, no, no, no. You know, it'd be like one of those crowd meters trying to like, who's gonna be louder? Who's gonna be louder? No, they're not contrary because they're not trying to do the same thing. The law is shutting you up in your sin. So that you, you see like, oh my word, I need grace. I need mercy. I need the spirit of God to give me new life. I need the blood of Jesus to wash over me. I need this by promise because I sure as shooting can't do it by works. They're not contrary at all. Not at all, Paul says. And then in the, in the, in the last few verses, he tells us kind of what it means then to, to live as a Christian and how we relate to the law in light of the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith should be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Again, not contrary they're working together. They're, 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 they're doing different things that we might be justified, counted righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Hear that again. You, dear Christian, United to Jesus Christ by faith. Washed clean by the blood of the lamb. Having been crucified with him and no longer living by works, no longer living in the flesh, but living by faith in the son of God. You, dear Christian, who are a new creation in Christ, you, dear Christian, are not captive under the law any longer. There's nothing that you will read in the law or any other imperative in scripture for that matter that will condemn you ever again. You don't have to feel the law as a crushing weight any longer because it's not. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. We're not under that ministry of condemnation. We're not under that ministry of death. We're under now the ministry of life, the ministry of the new covenant, the ministry of Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Were you united to him in baptism? You wear him. You're clothed in his righteousness. You stand justified by faith in Christ before God Almighty, no longer under the law, no longer hearing a single condemning word about your life. Oh, Satan, he'll come and accuse. He'll come and lie. He'll come and get in your brain and be like, oh, you better you look inside. There's probably more sin in there. Of course there's more sin in there. And Jesus died for all of it. So shut the hell up, Satan. 
You have nothing else to say to me. And then he reminds us in these last two verses, because he knows that the issue isn't with us. He, he knows like it's not just gonna be a law thing. He knows that we'll find anything at all that makes ourselves feel better. If we can't go back to the law of God, we'll come up with a new law. We'll come up with some new source of hope, security, and identity. We'll come up with, with something. And so he just reminds us, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That there, there's no ethnic, no cultural, no economic or social status that dictates our standing with God. There is only Christ. And by faith in Christ, we are heirs of God Almighty. See, he knows what we'll do. If we can't go back to the, the, the law as, as it's written, then we'll just write a new one that makes ourselves feel good about ourselves. We'll point to, to something that we just kind of naturally do and be like, oh, that's what it's all about. I, I naturally get up kind of early. Like I just, I always have since I was a kid. Never really been able to sleep in. So guess what it's really easy for me to attach righteousness to? Getting up early and reading my Bible while everybody else is asleep. The reality is I just suck at sleeping. It has nothing to do with righteousness. I'm just up early and it's dark outside and I have a tendency to go crazy. And so I have to read something that keeps my mind on the right thing. That's all that's going on there. It's not righteousness. It's desperation. That's the kind of thing we do. And so I want to end you with this good news. If you are Christ's, and if you believe in him, you are, then you are heirs of the promise. It's all yours. It's all yours. The justification, the forgiveness, the righteousness, the freedom, the, the, the not being under the weight of the law, it's all yours. Heirs of the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Most gracious Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for the hope that you give us in your word. We thank you for the clarity of the gospel as Paul announces it. We thank you that you're not looking for us to get it right. But looking at us and seeing and knowing that we never will, you've said, hey, here's my son. Rest in him. And I ask, Father, by your spirit, even right now, we would find rest for our weary, weary souls that keep trying to perform and keep failing, that keep trying to take hold of that which is offered for free in Christ and keep losing our grip because we're trying to do it by our own efforts. And help us by your spirit to lay down in the bosom of our Savior and rest as your children. In Christ's name we pray, amen.